about a year ago, we tried to discern the times by making predictions of what would happen in 2022. Tonight, we'll see how we did. Welcome to The Conquering Truth. I'm Dan Horn. I'm Jonathan Seitz. I'm Charles Churchill. And I'm Joshua Horn. The Bible says in Ecclesiastes 8.5, He who keeps his command will experience nothing harmful. And a wise man's heart discerns both time and judgment. Last year about this time, we, we did a podcast where, well, first of all, we talked about the year in review, our first year of podcasting. And then at the end of that podcast, we made a series of, of predictions of what we thought based on looking at what was happening in the world, what, what would happen in 2022. And, you know, we should be held accountable. So tonight we'll go through and, and consider what all the, the predictions we made and see how they turned out. And make some new ones. And make some new ones false weights and measures that hasn't bubbled through the economy. So we should expect inflation to continue pretty bad in 2022. I think they're going to say, oh, we can just get rid of inflation. And I think there's still a big right. pile of money that needs to flow through. We were saying it would be substantially higher, and it was definitely substantially higher, even though President Biden had said it would be gone by the beginning of the year. And let's be clear on this one. This one isn't like us being incredibly wise. This is just going... <laughs> This is showcases how much people lie, how much just how much the experts lie. They just lie. They could know these things. We're not sitting here being geniuses. We're just going, you cannot print that much money, dump it into the economy, and its effects vanish. It's not possible. God is God has made the world where there's there are there are costs. Right. False weights and measures are real judgment. Right. And we have false weights and measures, and so that produces real judgment on our society and and we felt some of that. I think one of the things that, I think you said it, but that that people were starting to recognize this and stop. And what we found out, that wasn't true. Right. right. <laughs> right? I mean, they ended up, you know, another $1.7 trillion or whatever on on the infrastructure. And then another, or 1.6, 1.9, I don't remember what it was. When you're talking about trillion, why does it matter? Um, and then they did another one just, you know, a month ago, or the 1.7 for you know, and, and granted, some of that was continuing expense, but that was $200 billion in new expense or something. And so you're talking about another $2 trillion in excess that needs to go through the economy. I mean, it's going to – it's definitely going to continue to cause inflation. Right. So you're, you're renewing this one for next year or for this year? <laughs> I think there will be more inflation. I think there is some mitigation of it. Um, they are raising the interest rates high enough that one of the things that I said last year is that – that basically the way they do the inflation is that they absorb they absorb price increasing in housing over a four-year period. And they might actually raise the interest rates enough now. It looks like they're going to raise them. My guess is, is that they'll raise them enough to drive us into, into a recession. And when we go into a recession, housing prices might drop. So that might give some negative inflation to take some of the pressure off. So it wouldn't surprise me if it's less this coming year or this year than it was last year. But I've but I still expect it to be significantly higher than their target. Right, which, and it depends on how you're talking about inflation, too. If you're talking about the money supply increasing versus the prices going up, which is how most people do it, which is why they talk about how they can manipulate inflation and mitigate the inflation while still printing money when, you know, if you're increasing the money supply, your money supply is inflating. And whether that works itself, how, how much that affects prices can be affected by other things. But you're still inflating your currency, and it's still you, – you can't really take that back. Right. They're always – they always have people actually becoming more productive, which offset – I mean, that's what they're stealing from effectively. And so if the productivity actually increases, their inflation doesn't notice as much. But in the end, they've stolen the effect of that productivity. But what they're, they're doing by raising the interest rates, what they do is they make capital more expensive – right, to borrow money, more expensive, which means that it's more difficult to increase productivity. So it actually, they think increasing interest rates will actually reduce inflation, but historically, it doesn't track like that. I mean, that's just making it up. I mean, the reality is you have to control your spending. You have to increase productivity. The best way is like what Reagan did. Reagan came in and increased the productivity of the American people, and that's how they broke the the continuing inflation. It wasn't by raising interest rates. Interest rates were, you know, so Reagan talked about the misery index. It's like 22% or something, the the unemployment rate plus the inflation rate. Because if you do this, you just drive up your unemployment rate, and then you have to, you know, you have to increase your interest rate higher, and you get this runaway thing. That's what Carter did. It doesn't work. But they're back to trying to do the same thing, and we should have no expectation that that will work. 
you could say that there's a housing bubble that will somewhat collapse in some places. Like where we are, there's so much demand still. I just don't see it. Prices coming down. But there's other places where there was a, a peak of prices that it would be easy to see. When you see God putting pressure on the people who call themselves by his name, you see that the point of that pressure is to separate sheep from goats. And so you're going to get the opportunity for the true believers to wake up, to become more faithful, more holy. And you're going to see people who weren't believers, but who were just hanging around, you're going to see them drifting away. And churches who are made up mostly of that latter half are going to disappear. And churches who were made up more of the former half are going to get stronger. Now, they might get smaller. Um, they, that, and that, that's not necessarily a bad thing. Or they might get bigger because there's going to be people who are true believers in those other if churches. If they start out small, they might get bigger. <laughs> Statistics really aren't out for 2022 of what church attendance looks like. But we can see that. You know, according to, to one place, they say that monthly church attendance in 2019 was about 34% of Americans attended church at least once a month. You know, by 2020, it was 28%, and then 2021, it was 26%. So that's almost a, you know, that's, that's a sixth of the people dropping off. That's a pretty big percentage to drop. And it looks, you know, they've done some more studies now that are 2022 studies, and there's one that Barna did that's showing weekly. So these are different statistics because these are weekly rather than, than monthly. But and he did it by generation. And what's really interesting is that the older people didn't come back hardly at all. So it's on there as boomers. And actually the, the millennials are the ones that they actually, a larger percentage of them came back so that they have a higher church attendance than they did before the pandemic, which is a pretty interesting statistic. For the boomers, less than 25% or right at 25% attend church, but over 35% of the millennials do, which is not what I was expecting to right. see. And what's interesting is that the, the millennials, there's a higher percentage of, of non-white, you know, people of color millennials, and there is a distinct difference between the people of color and the white. In terms of it, the the people of color that have come back, the millennials have far higher church attendance than the the white millennials do. Interesting. Which oh, there's that I did put that chart in there as well. Wow, ten percentage points higher. Yeah, and forty five percent of of non white millennials attend church on a weekly basis. That's pretty pretty interesting for the church and just thinking about going forward how does that how should the church think about that and what should it do about that if that trend continues one thing is the reaction so the the people like the boomers that were attending church regularly it kind of then covid hit it kind of broke their habit so then they reconsidered and they didn't start back again where it looks like a positive thing from it is some of the millennials are actually starting to think about you know eternity and not just the temporal life and how do you how do you make something more important than just being about yourself right i could think of any number of reasons to explain that and i don't i don't know how to parse it or balance it or i mean it could be hey covid caused a lot of fear mm -hmm. and when god's causing fear there are, there are appropriate responses to that and at the same time it there was also a hunger that developed for human interaction because it had been taken away and hey this was an outlet that so most churches don't have that much human interaction but it's it's more than being locked up in your apartment sure you know it's just it's just getting out and being around people and when you're not even allowed to go grocery shopping and i mean one is also the number of churches became very focused on critical race theory so that could be driving millennials to go too. Is that that it's not so much about the gospel for a lot of these churches? I mean, we're going to talk about this in a bit about the SBC. But you know, if it's not about the gospel, it might be that it's appealing to. And some of this is unquestionably deliberate because you look at <clears throat> the people that are pushing CRT. They're usually associated with seminaries and stuff in these denominations. You know, I'm talking about pushing in the Christian churches or the quote-unquote Christian churches, that a lot of that push is coming from the people that are running seminaries and stuff. So they're the ones that are dealing with the younger people. And 
I, I remember when we did a, uh, at a conference, we did a question about rap music and that just caused people to be you know, so upset. The idea of reformed rap that, that this isn't, this isn't the way the gospel is supposed to be preached. And people got very upset about it because they said that way you drive off all the youth. And a lot of seminary professors were very, you know, they felt they had an obligation to go denounce that, that Q and A. And so you look now, I wonder how many of them are pushing for CRT and stuff in churches because they go, this is how you get the millennials. And maybe they're right. Not that you get them to the gospel, but that you get them to populate your you churches. You to engage, right? You get them to give money. Right. Because if your focus is not God, your focus is money in the end. And so what you're doing is just trying to collect a group of people or collect power as opposed to actually getting people to turn towards God. So that's another, they could be right that that is a way to attract people because they're attracting the millennials in a significant way, according to Barna. Yeah, it would be interesting to see a, it would be interesting to see a breakdown as far as like what types of churches that they're at, you know, what types of churches are starting to thrive, what types of churches are actually starting to see them because it's it's like you said, just looking at the numbers it's really hard to know what's happening. But it does look like something's happening. Yeah. I mean, yeah, pretty clearly something's happening. You don't get that kind of a, I mean from from 25 to 45, I mean that that's a that's a big shift from 2019 Right, pre. I mean, so there's there's been a there's been a definite shift, and especially because the the white millennials and the non white white millennials didn't have that much of a discrepancy between the two in in 2019, 2020, and 2021. They were flipping back and forth or tied. Now all of a sudden, there's a distinct difference. I mean, it's but they both grew. They it's both grew. Just the non white grew significantly more. Right. But they both grew, and that's really interesting. If and, you look at twenty I mean, percent to forty-five percent, that means that the number of non-white millennials that attend, started attending church—I mean, it doubled in a year. Three possible explanations, and there could certainly be others that we gave. But the the three possible that we cited, all of them are an opportunity for the true gospel. And so, one thing that churches that are like ours that are smaller and you know. And, you know, we're not a bag of church that's attracting people to CRT or anything like that. But we should really be asking ourselves, is there an opportunity here to reach young people? Because are they are they looking for something? Because, you know, if it's fear, that's a good thing. Right. I mean, because one of the issues prior to, I mean, in 2019, when you would go out, if you go out witnessing, it was really easy. If you found people out, they were not interested in engaging in a conversation about something serious. I mean, you know, you could, I mean, I'm not saying you could never get them to, but I'm saying a lot of times if you went out to the venues where people were, the reason they were at that venue was to kind of unplug from stress, to not think about, to not think about serious things. And so at some level, like you said, this is, this is a real shift. And so, I mean, it means there are people who are open to being engaged at least to some level, which is, like you said, at a minimum, that's opportunity. And, you know, it used to be that, you know, a lot of young people, they'd be mocked and stuff if they went to church. So now all of a sudden, if you see these numbers, that would indicate that there's going to be a lot of people that aren't going to be mocked for going to church that are in this, this age group. I mean, the Southern Baptist Convention seems like it's going to continue to really have some upheaval. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it, there's a part of me that feels like it's headed towards either fracturing or, you know what I mean? It's, it's gotten it, within the, I mean, there, there's a group, there's a conservative group within the Southern Baptist Convention that I don't think is going to be able to stand around and watch the direction that it's headed without doing something. I just don't know what it's going to look like. So I'd, I'd say that the, the Southern Baptist Convention did go through a lot of upheaval this year. I think that one was pretty spot on in terms of, you know, they, some of the things they're doing are just inexplicable in the sense that, you know, they, Al Mohler, elect, they elected a president who's not a Trinitarian. <laughs> well, Al Mohler comes out as very CRT and kind of, I mean, it, he becomes the head of the CRT movement in the SBC. And all of a sudden this stuff comes out about that he was at Southern, he's been pushing it, and he hired a professor that was pushing it. And, I mean, it becomes very, you know, he was not who I would have expected to lead that wing. And then you have the founders movement and Tana, Tom, Tom Askell and those people that they get accused of all the sexual stuff and hiding sexual stuff because they were on the board of the SPC. And then they end up bringing out this relative unknown from Texas and making him the president because basically there weren't enough people that could stand either one of the leading candidates. 
so that there's no way they could get enough votes. So then they just kind of do a dark horse candidate that nobody really knows anything about him just because they want somebody to have the position. I mean, I'd say that's pretty messed up. I mean, it was pretty. And <laughs> so there wasn't an SBC split like this this past year, but the velocity is still towards upheaval. So I think we can all say I don't think the SBC is going to sort itself out this year. <laughs> it didn't move in the direction opposite what we said it was going to do. Right. The next one is actually even about just the specific politi- politicization of COVID and, and how that has been, you know, how that was driven by the government. I, you are still going to have COVID in another, in another year. You know, you can't put that, you know, the, the politicians have their own motivations for, for what they do, but, but, the, but, they, but so much fear has been built up um, in the people that even if the politicians change their tune, you know, there, there's, it's, it's still, it's still going to be top of mind in a lot of ways. I would, I, I can't see how it's not a big issue in a year from now. It's the fear of contact with other people that, you know, you come in contact with somebody else, you might die, they might kill you. Let's just tell everybody that getting close to other people is bad for you and could kill you and is bad for your health. Is the pandemic still going? I think it is, isn't it? It is. Yeah. Yeah. Somebody in our church just got COVID this week. Um, and so probably more than one, but who knows? <laughs> probably more than one, but only one that <laughs> at least got a false positive, if not a true positive. They're still talking about how the new um, strain that's that just started, the one that's in China, is a lot more more uh, spreads more rapidly than the previous ones. And yeah, they're still. There's still a group of people that's trying to, to gin up terror about it. I'm really surprised when I go out as to how many times I'll go out and the, there's a huge number of people wearing masks all of a sudden again. You can feel like it's over and then you can go out and the attitude of people is, no, it is still very much going on. And it is still very much something that, that people are, something is causing them to go from not wearing a mask to going back to wearing a mask and being very, and, and, and it happens in waves and it happens. I mean, and so there's a part of it where there, there's still a group of people who are absolutely pushing fear and there are people who are listening and, t- and tuned into those channels. And sometimes it's what, not in the way that I would have predicted. Like this summer, we were in uh, rural New England for a while and very, I, I don't know if we saw virtually anyone wearing masks. And then you go to North Carolina and pe- everyone has a mask on, right. which was, would not be what I would have guessed. Right. I mean, and, and I, in fairness, I think we can come at it from the other side, too, because just looking at the kinds of things people want to populate my Facebook with, I've got lots of people who have a set of fear that's COVID motivated, but it's COVID from the other side. You know, they are trying to kill you with a vaccine. You know, not just not this isn't just, oh, the vaccine's unwise or, you know, not that it's like, oh, no, they're trying to kill you with this or or you should avoid contact with people who have had the vaccine because it might do bad things to your health or your reproductive right. You know, and it's like, and it's so, so the fear is, you know, cuts across the, all the cultural lines. It's not just one-sided. Every time somebody dies suddenly, there's a, there's a, there's, they were killed by the vaccine. And, and whereas there's a real possibility that there was a percentage of people who are being killed by the vaccine, the implication is, is the number of people who are being killed by the vaccine is they're going, it's just in the millions. And you're kind of going... And I it's don't think intentional. You, can, you can't be covering and, up that many deaths. And at the same time, I can completely believe that they're ignoring the fact that there are people who are having really serious side effects. You know, enough of those documentaries have come across my my purview that it's like, you know, it's like they're out to get you. You know, this is just an extension of of a Darwinian um, philosophy, and they're they are intending to, you know, they want to reduce population, and this was a tool that they could use to do it. And I mean, and it's just, you know, you you. There's no need to create conspiracy theories about any of this. Everything really bad that's happened is well documented. You don't have to add right. intentions where they're where I think the intention of getting rich by certain, you know, yeah, I think that's real. The intention <laughs> of getting make... rich, of protecting political careers, of right. selling books and newspapers, you know, that that's all obvious. You know, one of the things that you started with, I think, in that clip, Jonathan, was that that people would, you know, the fear of people. I want to double down on that one, and I want to double down on it for about 20 years if we do the podcast that long. Um, 
I have. Please I, no. Please <laughs> no. Please <laughs> and no. we do this episode <laughs> that long. <laughs> the breathing will only I'll get worse. Once a year. <laughs> but but I, I don't think we have any way of really co- uh, of of capturing what it has done to a group of children in particular. Uh, and that's what I'm thinking about. Adults, I think, are more resilient. They can cope. They've had a longer lifespan for which this is a smaller s- time slice of their life. But for children, to put them in that kind of a window where all of a sudden the lessons that you're teaching them and training them is that stay away from other people, contact with other people can harm you, kill you, might kill grandma. You know, I, and, and you do that at very impressionable ages. I think that we're going to see effects of that that I have I don't even know how to measure how bad that's going to be but I think that's something that's inevitable like kind of a generational psychosis. Yeah, I think I think you're going to see a group of children where in 15 years we're going to have we're going to start talking about this in the context of the employability of those kinds of people and what effects it has on them as they enter the job market when they graduate from college that's the kind of thing that i'm talking about i wonder though if it's going to be that drastic of a change or more of an incremental one because you already have a certain set of the population that grows up just vegetating in front of a television or a video game console or a computer so i wonder how different how different that would be than... But hey, you've legitimized it now. You know, hey, that's safer than actually going out and doing things with other people. I agree with that. And I think also on the other side, though, I think with adults that there was a big push of not having people get back together. And I think businesses over time are going to see more and more of a cost of that and they're going to start to require. I mean, you see some of it already. I mean, Musk is coming out and saying, no, if you're not, if you're working from home, you're not working for me with, you know, unless you're exceptional. You know, so I think that you're probably going to find more companies that that stop the bragging where they go, oh, everybody's so much more productive if they work from home. Some people are. Some people, if they don't have a, a 45 minute commute each way, which I think you know the average U.S. commute is something like 40 minutes or 45 minutes or something, and you go, well, they'd be more productive if they didn't have that commute. But still, there's a lot of productivity that comes from being around people. The constraint of being around people, the you know, just the the collaboration because you have to talk to people and think things through, and it just works very differently on a phone. So, so my guess is you're going to see more companies that start to shift back to say. There needs to be a lot more in presence work, because while there's certainly people that are that are good at working by themselves, I, it's not that broad in the marketplace. Right. It's going to push some companies out of business, I think. Is what's I mean, because if you have both the recession and you have some other things, so you're going to have. My guess is you're going to have some companies go out of business, and then when you have actually the economy, if it comes back, when it comes back, and smaller companies, you know, start again that's when it's easier to change culture, right? Is when you're creating new, when you kind of when you're creating new companies. Yeah, it's so actually easy in a recession. safe predictions that some companies will go out of business. <laughs> I, know, I, I, <laughs> I mean, at least one, possibly even more than one. But I mean, I do think that that, that, that shift can happen without like the company going right. out of business because you have recession and you kind of go, well, we need to get rid of people. Guess what? We're going to get rid of the people that we never see. Right. Which, I mean, even years ago when people first started working from home, that was always the thing is that, boy, if your manager never sees you, you know who's going to be on the top of the layoff list. Right. And so I think more and more that thought process will, because there's some reality to it. Yeah, the exceptional workers that are actually producing a lot more than other people, they're going to go, yeah, we're going to keep them. But other than that, you have the choice between the guy you see all the time and the guy you never see. Which one are you going to lay off? The Fed literally said, too many people have, people have too much money. So we have to keep raising rates, which is <laughs> maybe they shouldn't have sent them checks two years ago. <laughs> I mean, you know, I mean, it was just, I mean, it was just blatantly, you know. So I mean, yeah, they're they're absolutely trying to increase the cost for people to live so that they can they can push the economy down. So I mean, yeah, there's gonna there seems like there's gonna be some sort of recession, and that's that's going to have an impact on businesses. I don't know how bad it's gonna be. My impression is is it could be pretty bad. Yeah, you know, when your neighbor gets laid off, that's that's a downturn. When you get laid off, that's a recession. Right, right. That's and so, personal. you know, some of this is that too. Is that that what is a recession? You know, this thing earlier in the year where they were going, well, we had two down quarters, but that's not a recession. It used to be 
that if you have two down quarters, it's guaranteed it's a recession. But there have been other recessions that have been declared to be recessions that Without didn't that, have two right. down quarters. So that was like the the limit. If you have two down quarters, it's guaranteed. But now all of a sudden, that's not a recession anymore. So they're the way that they arbitrarily measure things, you know, they very well might figure out a way to measure it that they go, there wasn't a recession. Right. They're normalizing central brand, central banking, <laughs> their, their extremes, basically, is what they're doing. And even with inflation, they've been doing the same thing. They change terms all the time so that they go now. It's not the core inflation rate. It's not the overall inflation rate. Now it's this new inflation rate. That's the real one that we're monitoring. So they just keep changing it so that people can't monitor what they're actually doing and can't hold them accountable. And and you're just going to keep stirring this pot of resentment. And, and you've seen really terrible things happen in places like Portland. It wouldn't be surprising if things like that don't happen in a city near you. So I, I'll admit I was wrong on that one. It wasn't a, a year of riots. Didn't happen. But I, I mean, we had a political election that was largely a peaceful election. Just despite whatever your favorite news source said about how turbulent it was, no buildings were invaded. I mean, and one of the things I think is that you can kind of look back and take from that is there are times where the unrest in the nation is ginned up by, I mean, there, you know, there was this there was this idea going on that you know that we had a democracy on the brink and America was, you know, what I mean, and and there was a part of it where I mean, like you know, is and it wasn't anywhere near as fragile as they made it out to be in one th- I mean it wasn't fragile in the way they made it out to be fragile it's fragile in a very different way than they made it out to be you know what I mean the things that they were scared of aren't the things that were they scared or was it just I think it was completely a political stunt a lot of people are scared well I mean from I think the- January 6th I actually I actually do think January 6th scared people and then they saw it as and then they saw it as a pure political opportunity but i do think it i think they were legitimately scared that oh no the right is actually going to behave in a way that's been like we're doing and i don't think they were ready to deal with that and then they realized the right reacted by by condemning the actions of them and they said oh never mind we We can can use this we can use this and so i agree so from that point forward I agree, but I do think there was a moment of actual real terror on their part that they had pushed the right too far. And I think there was a moment where they thought that, you know, that they may have overplayed their hand and, oh, no, what do we do if they're actually fed up? And I think, you know, there is a certain fear of, you know, certain people and it's, you know, certain people on the right. And in a way, it's understandable because there are people out there who are, you know, have less regard for the truth in certain areas than traditionally people had. I mean, not politicians have always lied, but they're telling, you know, more lies about specific things. You know, they're, they're, they're not just lying to the voters, they're lying about, to the voters about the process, right. you know, in certain ways that, you know, and I, you know, it, it definitely goes both ways, but I can understand to some extent why they're, why they're worried, yeah. you know. Because if Donald, if Donald Trump's populism had actually been what they were scared it could be, that is how you get, you know, I mean, that, that is how, but I mean, in the end, the right wasn't going to behave in that way. They weren't going to condone those activities. They in 2022, in 2020, <laughs> who knows about 2020? Right, I mean, and, and, right, things could change. But in the end, I mean, the, the overwhelming response of the right was they shouldn't have done that. Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of COVID was ginned up in the first place. Not that it wasn't a serious disease. I'm not saying that people didn't die of it and stuff, but it was a political weapon against Trump. The problem is, is you start, you know, he who lives by the sword dies by the sword, right? I mean, right. that's what's happening. Roll and so the de- that will roll on. The- <laughs> right. And so, so the Democrats wanted to use this as a political weapon to destroy Trump. And so they stoked up this thing. And now they're trying to figure out how to stop it. But it wouldn't surprise me if all of a sudden they find a key that they get the media to stop hyping it the way they did and it drops. I'm just surprised they haven't found one yet. The media just needs something else to cover. That's as effective. And that was Ukraine, right? The thing that they could cover. Right. And it had already happened at this point where President Biden, although I didn't know it at the time, where President Biden had gone over or made a speech where he said that they had to bring Ukraine into NATO. Well, threatening to bring Ukraine into NATO is, I mean, that's the same as the Cuban Missile Crisis. I mean, there's very little difference. It's like trying to to say, we're about to attack you. And for 
Russia to respond. I mean, everybody knew Russia would respond. That anybody that's watching that understands the geopolitical politics there, they just, you can't have NATO as the next door neighbor of, with Ukraine right there. It just right. doesn't work if you're Russia. So you had to do something. And so I think later and we did podcasts on it, and I thought that what would happen is that he would just kind of stir it up to get it to be a front news story, and then it would go away. But it went further than that. And obviously, we've got a war, and so the war just swept COVID off the front pages. You know, Putin definitely played a part in that. Oh, no question that Putin played a part in that. Just like JFK did in the Cuban Missile Crisis. So we just have to be careful not to, to, be, to look at it and say, well, we have the Monroe Doctrine. And we've been willing for the last 180 years to go to war over the Monroe Doctrine, to say that Russia can't go to war over Ukraine. But it also very effectively got COVID off the front pages. It did. And like we talked about before, it wasn't, I mean, they've stirred it up enough that it still has its own force. It still has its own life. There has been a lot less talk about it in the media. But like you said, now it's kind of the grassroots seem to be carrying it rather than the media. For a long time, it was the media that kept pushing it and kept trying to keep it on the front burner of everything. It's the Hatfields and the McCoys of today. You know what I mean? I mean, it's, it, it really kind of reminds me almost of that sort of it's feuding. It's it's. It's and, you know, talking about what's going to happen in the future, I think that that as we look in 2023 and people start to look towards the 2024 election, I think, especially in the Republican Party, you'll start to see that. I actually think Donald Trump's a pretty weak candidate. I'm not sure how far he'll go because he is so much into pushing the vaccines was his big, you know, they can it's easy to find recordings of him saying that the vaccines were the most the biggest thing that he did. And, you know, the people on the right aren't that pro-vaccine. If it becomes an argument between the Hatfields and the McCoys and the, most of the Republicans are more the ones that are going, we shouldn't have done what we did with COVID. Well, that puts Donald Trump on the wrong side of the party. Yeah. So it'll be interesting to see how that plays out. Because So you look at somebody like Abbott from Texas. You look at DeSantis from Florida. You look at the governor of South Dakota. You know, all these people that were like trying to stand up against Trump because they were standing up against Trump when he was president, saying right. everything should be shut down. They're going, no, we're not going to shut down. I mean, they're all pretty well positioned in a primary to go, no, you were trying to shut us down. You were not following the science. You were not looking at it. You weren't talking to advisors that were reasonable. You were looking to Jared Kushner, because that's who he was looking towards, who's very liberal. And so, you know, it seems to me that he's in a position where he's not that great of a candidate. And I, you know... My personal opinion, which could be very wrong, is I don't think that he'll make it that far in the, the 2024 primary season. Yeah. If you asked me a year ago, I would have said he was set up to be the next candidate. I mean, you know, and it's been really interesting to see how, how that shifted and the things that have caused those shifts. They thought that what they would do is they would put President Biden in there because he wouldn't be radical. They could win. And then... I think they honestly believe that their policies would be really popular with the American people. The problem that they have is a lot of their base came from countries like that. <laughs> they came from countries where socialism had been practiced in their base that they were so sure that Hispanics will always vote for the Democrats. The Hispanics are going, wait, these guys are really socialists. This is just like the countries that we fled from that were impoverishing us. And so I think it's a pretty dramatic shift and the Democrats are putting all their dice on one thing. So I think it's going to be a shift that's going to affect things for a while. In particular, related to that was the, the push by the Democratic Party to do the, um, to, to remove some of the cost of the education. Because, I mean, even though, so that got, that got cut out by that. I mean, you know, they're, I think it looks like they're not going to be able to do it the way they had planned to do it. But in the end, I mean, their goal was it was it was them it was them pushing even more so and abandoning it was abandoning their base that had been their base for a long time in a lot of ways. And I'm not sure that I'm not sure exactly how much Roe v. Wade played into things and how much shift there was there. But I mean, there was a point where they were barreling over the last year they were barreling headlong into continuing that strategy of putting you know the, the colleges are the only place where they really see as having their their stronghold. And you look at the demographics from the election, and one of the reasons that the election turned out so differently is 
is, you know, what I was saying there is that the Hispanics would stick with the Republican Party, and they pretty much did. I mean, that they didn't go back. Instead, what the Democrats did is they doubled down going for the young people. And the youth vote, like you said, they said, we'll give you each $20,000 if you vote for me right. effectively. And so they ended up getting, you know, the youth vote actually stayed about the same. You know, in off years, you usually have pretty big drops. The youth vote didn't have a pretty big drop. And so that's why, you know, the, the Democrats ended up keeping the, the Senate and didn't lose that many seats in the House is because, you know, it worked. They, they bought. But in doing that, they did buy a different constituency. They definitely abandoned the blue collar constituency because the blue collar constituency is going, we're the poorer people typically we make less money but yet we have to pay for the people who went to a college to play around for five or six years and that you know that's basically you're sticking a knife in in that part of your party and driving them off and it seems to me when biden did that with an executive order that he had to figure that he doesn't have the authority to spend eight, you know eight eight hundred billion dollars almost a trillion dollars he said he was going to spend doing that right and yet he's pretending like he can do this out of his own volition that, you know, the Constitution is really clear. It has to come from the House of Representatives. He's saying he can do it without, without the House of Representatives being involved at all. He had to know that it would be, you know, stopped. People have been bugging him to do it a long time. He does it at the right time so that the courts aren't going to stop it until after the election. And, he, and what he very clearly broadcast was intent. You know, I mean, I, mean it, it, I think that message came through very strongly as we – we care about you. We, you know, I mean, and whether that will continue to be. I was going to say, we'll buy your vote is what <laughs> right. I think it came across I mean, in politics, that is how you care about people these days. <laughs> and so, I mean, I, it, it very much worked. We were looking at the demographics changing according to race because there's always been those pretty bright lines where, right. where we're starting to see shifts. With this last election, if you ignore race and you just look at gender and marital status, that tells a huge story. And, it, I mean, it tells a story that it's told for a long time. But but married men, married women, and unmarried men all voted a majority for Republicans. Married women voted I'm, – I'm sorry, unmarried women voted a massive majority Democratic. And a lot higher percentage of them voted too. Right. I mean, they I, mobilized their base. Yes, very much so. And you say, okay, that tells you a lot right there. And you, So if you want to talk about a demographic shift – there's a lot of there's a lot at play. There's a lot of different ways that you could be parsing up the demographics, and that one tells a story. And I just think that that what we're going to see going forward is less and less of race being this way that you can divide up the electorate that really makes that much sense. So are we going to talk about our big uh, whiff that we may or our big our big miss? I mean, I think one of the one of the things that I think we all thought. At least I don't know. If we, I shouldn't spread it around. Yeah, I no, I definitely no. thought very strongly was that we were going to see a red wave in this, this in the midterms. The Democrats are saying let's just increase the socialism, right? If we give two more years of schooling, if we give at the front end, if we give two more years of schooling at the back end, if we give everybody checks, if we just become more socialist, people will love it, and they think that's the solution. But that's what people are rejecting now. Not that this is a very long limb to go out on, but I think you're going to see a pretty significant shift in the in the legislature legislature next year between the House of Representatives and the Senate. We kind of talked about how that you know the the Democrats were successful in in, in keeping the the youth vote. There's been a lot of discussion. I mean, Donald Trump said that it was because of Roe v. Wade and the Republican position on not supporting abortion for rape, incest, and life of the mother, which isn't borne out by looking at the statistics in which, you know, and the performance at the states and the House of Representatives or the, or the Senate. And I mean, kind of my argument there was what that they would stop doubling down. And like we were just talking about with the, the giveaway about, you know, writing off loans. I mean, they doubled down and it worked. Yep. You know, there's a lot of factors and, you know, a lot of people have competing narratives as to, you know, what went wrong for who and why. Um, and, you know, one you know, one big thing that happened, you know, politically is Roe v. Wade being overturned, which, you know, I you know that's one of the most exciting things that happened. And then you can't follow that up with, you know, for me, one of the really disappointing things that happened is that I think every single statewide abortion initiative went on the pro-abortion side. You know, even in like uh, I think it was Kansas where they were just 
They were just wanting to make it so the legislature could control abortion and not the Supreme Court of Kansas. Even that fails in a pretty conservative state. So, you know, that certainly had an impact, you know, how much of an impact. And one of them, like Wisconsin or someplace, or North Dakota, I forget, somewhere over there, I mean, they basically voted to make infanticide. Oh, Montana. Montana. They made it constitutional. I mean, this is like the insanity of it is just unbelievable. Yeah. And it had been a Republican stronghold as far as political motivation to say, you know, had decades of Roe v. Wade, Roe v. Wade, Roe v. Wade. And now all of a sudden it's not there, but it's there for the other side. And the Republicans had written the playbook on how to do that one. Right. And, you know, I mean, one thing it tells us is that the problem for the past decades wasn't a couple people on the Supreme Court. The problem was in the nation. The problem was is that we love death. And, and there's a part of it where you, if you codify death for as long as we have, the nation changes. Hardens. Yeah. Well, and, and, and at the same time, it was codified because the nation loved death in the first sure. place, right? I mean, it was because there was a majority of the people that would vote would But it's no, it's no different activate. than Obergefell. I mean, Obergefell happens because the nation was drifting, but then it happens and the drift Boom, sure. all of a sudden becomes a slide. If you notice, right after it passed, there were all these – all these stories focusing on just the horrors of this being overturned. Have you really seen any, have you heard anything in the last three months? Have you heard, you know what I mean? I mean, just women dying in the streets because people are making them have babies in the, I mean, you know I mean? Just, I mean. And, it, and one thing to remember that's important is that, that the Democrats did a really good job of motivating people where they need to motivate them. Right. But in the end, like the total votes, there were a lot more votes that were Republican for the House of Representatives than there were Democrat. I mean, the, the, in general, it was a wave election in the sense that there were a lot more Republic, people that voted Republican. It's just the Democrats did a great job of making them not matter. Right. Still a real opportunity to move abortion forward because now it's at the state houses. And there was a shift towards Republicans in the state houses. It just wasn't at the national level. But it, a lot, unfortunately, a lot of them are are filled with people who are d looking at the vote total and not looking at morality. And they're saying, well, we're not going to do this because it's a losing issue. And especially when Donald Trump's going, if you don't support the three basic exceptions, the life of the mother, incest and rape, then there is no way you can ever win, which is what he came out last week and said. So when you have uh, the party, the most visible person in the party pushing for for it to be a party of death, what do you expect? I mean, hopefully that's enough. Hopefully, if he keeps saying things like that, that would be enough to get those people who consider him to be the, you know, like my neighbor who's got the Jesus is my savior and Trump is my president sign in the yard. Hopefully that's enough to take those kinds of signs down. I don't know if it will be. <laughs> I don't but, think it will be, but, but I'm... <laughs> but, you know, there's enough people that have pause about Trump after being very rabid Trump for for years Trump. who... who he just needs to keep saying stupid things like that for him not to be, like we were talking earlier, not to be a viable candidate in a couple of years. Th though we also did hear that for all of 2015, so, you know. Right. <laughs> and, and, you know, yeah. But at this point, he doesn't have the lure of the unknown. <laughs> you know, we kind of know what we're getting. He's a, he is a quantity now. I mean, speaking of the midterm elections and beyond, you know, I think a pretty safe prediction looking at the last decades of uh, the church's involvement in politics is the Christians will rally around candidates that are not biblically qualified. And, you know, they'll rally around their local representative who has a Republican after his name. They'll pick a Republican presidential candidate, uh, whether at the beginning or at the end, who is not biblically qualified. Well, I mean, when you look at it and you look at some of the candidates that, that were put out there, Herschel Walker, I mean, the presumption was you look at Georgia's, you know, quote unquote, the Bible Belt, part of the Bible Belt. And they just assume that somebody like Herschel Walker can give some some superficial religious language, and that will be sufficient to get the church to vote for him. And you know, and he won the primary, so it's hard to say that that wasn't true. And you look at, you know, Oz would be another example that, and these candidates were deeply flawed candidates, but the church wasn't going up and going, no, we should not have these people as candidates. I'll never vote for Herschel Walker. They go, he won a Heisman. 
You know, <laughs> so what? <laughs> right. He's, he was Trump. Trump supported them. I mean, tr- right. He yeah. spoke at the at the Republican convention, right, for Trump. I mean, he Trump supported him, and the church went. Are the professing believers went Trump supported him. He must be a good candidate. And and it did cost some elections because people won't actually discern. You know, even before all the scandals came out about him, it probably could have been known that not not qualified. And we and we did an episode specifically where we kind of talked about stop voting after the lesser of two evils that the church needs to. I mean, you know, we we spent a decent amount of time actually just talking about what sh- what criteria should we use for candidates. I mean, it, it's not it's not like it's it's not like it's impossible to figure out should this person be voted for or not. That's not that hard of a thing to figure out. I'll tell you just personally one of the things that, that's close to this is that with with everything that go, went on with COVID, I had a lot more interest in local politics than I've ever had. And it's also the first time in my life that everybody I voted for, and I did not vote for every option that I could have, but everybody that I voted for on the ballot won. First wow. time in my life that that's happened. That's so, never happened to me. <laughs> I, I I mean, you live on the wrong wrong county, <laughs> right. but um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah, yeah, county lines do matter. Yep, yep. So, but but hey, I mean, there, and I'm I'm sure I'm not the only person that that started thinking that way, and hopefully there are people who realize, hey, the local politicians have a lot more control over your life than somebody far away in Washington. And is I'm trying to deal with politicians in Durham and trying to deal with politicians in Wake County. Yeah, I mean, they have so much more of an impact, even though we can think of, you know, all the news stories and everything is about the the national people. But the local people have a lot more. Go try and build something in your backyard and see who cares more about what's going on and has more control over that. You know, something you actually want to do with your life standing in line at the voting place there was actually a candidate for office there so you know i asked him the question so where do you go to church you know my wife asked him what was his testimony and all of a sudden these things that i'm like why don't you have it on your website because you can tell a lot about a candidate not just i go to church but this is the church i go to because that's the first thing i do when i look at candidates is i try to figure out what church they go to which is usually incredibly difficult to find it anywhere and then once you find it you can go look at what they believe and go is he just pretending to be a christian or does he at least attend a christian church right i mean those are two very different things because you are looking for whether they fear god but anyway having those kind of conversations can drive people to to emphasize different things on their on their candidate sites and that that's that's how things shift even the ungodly having to pay lip service to christianity changes a nation because there's a part of it where just right now what they think is they don't even need to pay lips. You know, I mean, they they don't think Christianity matters anymore. They don't they don't think Christians think Christianity matters. They think right. They think Christianity doesn't matter, but saying you're a Christian matters. So they are quick to all say I'm a Christian on both sides of the aisle, right. because they still think that matters. Right. But I mean, no, unless you're New no York, unless you're California, that, right. right? I mean, there are Massachusetts, there are places where it doesn't, but right. for the majority of places, the majority of candidates still need to say they're Christian to think that they can win. Oh, we've never had a non-Christian elected president. <laughs> a non-claimed Christian? The Gospels become so corrupted, you can sell CRT as a version of the Gospel. You can sell communism as a form of the Gospel. And so this social Gospel is... Is, is is very appealing to these to these fairly well-to-do wealthy kids who you know what i mean they've, they've grown up on this they don't know any actual theology and they go this is the gospel well i mean it became a lot more overt right things that that al moeller had been doing in secret all of a sudden became you know very very well known in the in the sbc at the convention and so when i look at a lot of the different facebook groups that i'm on i see a lot more I see a lot more statements that are kind of social justice versions, taking Jesus statements that Jesus made and turning them into unjust ver- versions of how to apply this to culture. And, and they're, they, you know, they sound catchy, they sound interesting, they sound compassionate, but in the end there, there's no real justice in them. But they, but this is you know being promoted as this is love. This is what it means to love. This is how God transforms the world is by, like like forgiving student debt. 
Christianity is about forgiving. You know, it's, it's Christ- about dealing with the poor. They're all poor because they have student debt. And well, we, Christians have forgotten it. that the whole point of the gospel is that Christ paid a debt for us that we couldn't pay. And then they go, so how can you be upset about forgiving student debt? And you go, you're against forgiveness, <laughs> right? I mean, and, and, but this is and this and they're absolutely saying this is the gospel. And so you look at that and you go, I mean, you know, it's it's really hard when someone starts in that position. There's, you know, there's not a lot of just easy responses of, okay, we're let's gonna start. have to just sit and let's start with the beginning and read the Bible. And so it's, you know, there is just there is just no tweak or little nudge that you can give them. It's a lot more complex. And when you reach that point, what is the point of reading the Bible? I mean, seriously, because the Bible, if what you're saying is that the purpose of the gospel is to fix society, then the Bible was written about a very different society. And so it might have a few principles here and there, but what you really need to do is be preaching a gospel about how do you fix the problems today. Right. So where Jesus Christ said, forgive, you now say, well, this is about that student debt should be forgiven, that we should figure out how to right. the people that are being crushed by the weight of debt, how you can relieve that, and that this is the like the burden that Christ removed from us, not the burden of sin, but the burden of, of debt. And it's a normal degradation that happens in denominations, and it's, you know, I think that that's what, that's we saw it take a big step in the Southern Baptist Convention this year, and I suspect it will continue to go in that same direction. Yeah. And the good news is people will leave. So what about other things that we think will happen in the next year? Well, you know, we, we should go short term. You know, you have the whole uh, Speaker of the House debacle as we're recording it. You know, if we can't predict who this next Speaker of the House will be, why are we even bothering? <laughs> well, <laughs> I'll make my prediction of that, which is I think it'll be Kevin McCarthy. It's hard for me to see it being anybody else. It's just two parties negotiating very publicly. Right. It's a negotiation. What do you expect? And the media doing what they always do, which is try to... It's, it's, this is the worst thing ever. Can you believe this happened? Right. Yeah, the, the hysteria, because that's what drives v- viewers, that's what drives readers, that's what drives clicks, right. versus the people that are, that are trying to drive those things because they're trying to negotiate a better position. In our previous episode, none of the predictions were contentious. So, you know, might as well change it up now. And say, you know, I, you know, I'll, I'll, ha- I'll have to go with the other side and say he won't be Speaker of the House. It'll be some other, you know, not very conservative Republican. You can be wrong because if you want. <laughs> <laughs> For the Honorable Kevin McCarthy of the state of California, having received a majority of the votes cast, is duly elected Speaker of the House of Representatives. <laughs> Right now in the news, everybody's saying that they're going to negotiate the Ukraine war. I don't think the Ukraine war will end this year. I think it'll go through the whole year. That's what I was. That would yeah. be one thing that we look at the history of wars. Everybody always says they're almost over. They always say, "How look at how victorious people are. And it's just never true. Afghanistan took 10 years. There's no reason that we won't, we shouldn't think that we'll spend another, probably not 100 billion, but maybe another 50 billion in Ukraine over this coming year. And they've been fighting in Ukraine for almost 10 years, if not 10 years. Right, between so the not, provinces that, that Russia now occupies and the rest of Ukraine. Just the other day, President Biden said that, that what was going on there was genocide and was using, I mean, language that's, that from Russia's point of view would be incendiary. I mean, this is language where you're, I mean, you're accusing them of things that you're asking, you're beginning to accuse them of things that you want the UN to get involved in that you want other nations to get involved in and actually, you know, move in in a more active manner. And if they do that, it could cause, I mean, it could just cause real destabilization. I mean, Russia still has nuclear weapons. And if you put them in a corner... And they want to talk about how they're being impoverished. No, Ukraine is being impoverished. and, And we forget that our policies, how cruel they are. Because they are really cruel. Yeah. And it's pretty unbelievable how how filled with hatred we are as a country towards the Ukrainian people. Yeah. They're sitting in winter where, where something like the last time I checked, like 50% of the people had no power. Ukraine's a very cold country. We are being very cruel. We are leaving people without power. We're leaving people without heat. People will die. 
children we're causing them to be, be connecting the dots it's it's because of the u.s involvement that's stretching a war we're not out. doing something right we're not doing something sufficient enough to end the war because to end the war means we enter world war three because it will go nuclear for us to do what it takes to end the war so instead what we do is we keep sending them enough money so that the war continues without a possibility of ending and it's it could end tomorrow the that's what be really clear it could end tomorrow the provinces that the Ukraine government has been bombing for six years, they just have to say they're Russian, and it's over. That's all. Potentially. I mean, likely. Likely. Right. I'm saying that that's what Putin said before he went into the war. That's what he said last week. He hasn't changed his position. And so— Though he also said he wasn't going to invade, so— well, sure, he lies. I'm not saying he – but I am saying that the the reason that he said that over and over again, he's been pretty consistent with it. And so we keep pretending like we don't know. We do know. And there's no way Ukraine can hold out if President Biden said, we're not sending you any more aid, the war would end tomorrow. I don't think it's going to happen, but it might happen the next year. But what you're also going to see is, is unless something changed with Ukraine, the German government's going to fall. The, I mean, you're going to have all these governments in Europe that fall. And by fall, I mean, like, have a huge overturn in election. You have people that go through the winter, and they're saying this winter it won't be too bad because they still have enough supplies. But next winter, it won't be Ukraine that has 50% of the people without heat. It will be Germany that has 50% of the people without heat. And this Switzerland is already is not allowed to – I mean, I think they – I forget. Is it 64 degrees? Nobody's allowed to heat their home warmer than 64 degrees, or it's – yeah, well, that's Celsius, right? <laughs> <laughs> They're boiling in there. Oh, <laughs> 64 degree Fahrenheit. Just connecting the dots. And this is because Russia's a major supplier of energy to Europe. And that's been cut off. And that was cut off by Russia. And then, and then Russia some, blew up their pipeline? No, Russia's trying to fix their pipeline. <laughs> so we're pretty confident it wasn't Russia. The person that has the most interest is Poland and the United States. Other than that, nobody really had interest in that pipeline being blown up. Maybe somebody else did, but Poland doesn't have the technology. Um, not to, to kind of narrow down who the one was that blew it up, but you have one country that ha it's to their advantage because otherwise Germany right now would be pushing for a settlement so that the pipelines would open so that their people would have heat. They can't because you can't open the pipelines. And so unless those things come back online, so Russia has a real incentive to fix them because as soon as they fix them, then – the German people put pressure on the German government to force a Ukrainian resolution. It seems like there will be some degree. I, I don't know how much it'll – I mean, this is, again, one of those things that it's kind of like speed. It's been happening for a period of time, but there's there's been shifts in the media as to where news happens and where news moves through. And, you know, if Elon Musk is successful with some of the things he's trying to do with Twitter, I think it'll expedite that shift to some degree. I mean, and there's – you know, so there's a – there's a part of it where, where people look to get information that's reliable, how that information gets disseminated. I mean, there's a lot of things he could do that can change the, stru the structure of journalism and, and, and news can, can actually shift a lot faster than people think. I mean, it's, you could see major news outlets actually going under if, if things shifted in a certain way. I, I don't know that it'll happen in the uh, – the time frame is kind of but – I, but I see the pattern happening. But even CNN, I, I – saw an article today that CNN had a third of the viewers of Fox. So that's a pretty big shift. And there's a point where this just becomes economically not viable. Right. What, what has become very clear is that the government had a lot of, put a lot of pressure on people to control what was seen by the American people. And that's kind of been exposed. And so now the question is what happens about it? And you can see Musk doing it and my guess is is that if musk is actually successful that the other people will follow because they'll be afraid not to yeah because people like facebook and stuff it's hard for them to you know <laughs> it's hard for them to continue in that pattern once it's exposed and once musk is saying no we're going to be we're going to be more even-handed it's hard for me to see facebook not being more even-handed google it's easier to see them not being right because they're you know that, they're not the same that, sort of institution. They're not, they're, they're not the same sort of institution, but in the end, they have more power. Right. But in the end, you know what you get on searches has a lot, you know, more power than what you see on your Facebook feed in a lot of ways, and your Twitter feed. 
So, but the question is, do the Republicans do anything? And I don't think that they can, but that doesn't mean they wouldn't try. Well, right now they can't because they don't have a speaker. Of the I house. mean, once they have a speaker <laughs> of the house, <laughs> once Kevin McCarthy is the speaker of the house, I'm just root- I'm rooting for no speaker of the house for two years. <laughs> Anything that will happen because of the Republicans taking the House, which was gridlock. Well, I wish. <laughs> well, yeah, I, I think they're all so eager to spend money. I'm not sure there'll be much good yeah, luck. Grid, there will be gridlock either. on certain things, but then you know, wide agreement on spending lots and lots and lots of money. Maybe, maybe slightly less than before. Maybe not. Probably slightly less be- than before, mostly to position themselves for 2024. Um. And I do think that that it's likely that the House Republicans will start to do some investigations that might – I think the government has been proven to be pretty corrupt in certain ways, and I think that there will probably be more information revealed about that. Although Nunez tried to do a good job, and I don't know that he was able to reveal much, but more has been shown since then, so – so there might be some fruit of that. Or there might be no fruit of that. How about that for a prediction? <laughs> <laughs> you, you covered all the bases. By, you didn't even need Joshua to do the opposing <laughs> opposing prediction. But I would say that he'll try. I think Jordan, as the head of the Judiciary Committee, will try to do some of those investigations. It's a good exercise to to look at the world around you and think about how the Word of God applies to it and to try to reason through what's happening. Obviously, we made some some predictions, some thoughts as to what would happen in last year. And a lot of them weren't too bad, but obviously we didn't get it correct in every aspect. One of the things that as Christians we're supposed to be doing is gaining wisdom so that we can understand what's happening, so that we can actually affect what's happening. The church has kind of pulled back and said we should just be worried about ourselves rather than worried about caring about our neighbor. Understanding the times is one of the ways that we, should, that we can care for our neighbor. Thanks for listening. This has been The Conquering Truth, a project of Reformation Baptist Church. If you found this helpful, you can visit us online at theconqueringtruth.com and subscribe here or in your favorite podcast app. Thanks for watching. Thanks for watching.